Welcome everyone to Rock Life Podcast. This is Pastor Antonio. Thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited to have a, a special pair, a couple of guests with us. We have uh, Reverend Larry Reynolds and Dr. Vanessa Reynolds. Uh, Reverend Larry is a board member and uh, Dr. Vanessa, actually both of them, uh, are involved in several areas of ministry, including women's ministry and married's ministry, and have been at The Rock for 22 plus years. And so we are privileged to be here with them today. Uh, we are going to be talking about today a <coughs> session that they recently did in our Women Rock uh, Thursday morning Bible studies, just a plug there, uh, 9.30 a.m. on Thursdays for all of our women here at the church. And uh, they recently did a session that where they talked about um, their experiences coming from a single parent household that was called You Are Not Alone. Um, so uh, if you guys could share with us what makes you qualified to talk about this subject or yeah, welcome too. The difference here is I came from a large family. Um, I've got seven brothers and sisters, so my mom raised eight kids. Um, my grandmother was in the house, a so very influential. Uh, but the key that our upbringing, was we had a very strong spiritual background, a biblical background. My grandmother was a principled individual. And uh, my mom followed, followed her footsteps, so we were brought up with, you know, with the Word of God in our life, even though we may not have lived it every day. That was a key part of our upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of stories to talk about, but I'll let Vanessa kind of chat, chat a little bit about her background. Well, I think um, there are a lot of people that are raised by single moms <clears throat> or whatever, and I think the big qualifying thing is that we turned out okay, you know. Yeah. Um, right now we have uh, five children and, you know, I went on from um, coming from a single parent household to going to medical school and Larry's a successful businessman. And I think that because of that, um, we might be able to help some people that are in a similar situation. And, you know, I am an only child and my mom was alone. And um, she actually got married when she was like 15 and had me like at 17. And um, when the marriage didn't work, she found herself uh, without a job and without any skills and unable to get any credit. And in talking to her, you know, she said the biggest thing that she felt was like fear. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, that's one thing we address when we talk to the ladies is that fear, worry, and low self-esteem are some things that single moms have to battle. For me, being from a single parent household, I feel that um, rather than be detrimental, you know, that whatever Satan intends for harm, God turns around for good, that it actually made me a stronger person. You know, while my mom was working and I saw the struggle, I was able to um, come home from school, clean the house, you know, make dinner, and learn responsibility that maybe otherwise I wouldn't have been able to do. So I think that good does come from even bad situations. Right. right. It's good. And for me, my my mom, I was alluding to earlier, she raised eight kids um, by herself. And the challenge that she had was that's a lot of kids to raise and what kind of financial support did she have, which was pretty much zero. And now, as I look back, <clears throat> she had to have raised us eight kids on probably an income of less than $10,000 a year because she cleaned homes and now that we're old, old enough to understand that, we didn't know it then. We just used to go with her just so we could have some cookies in the, in the house we were cleaning, you know. <laughs> but for, if you really understand what was going on, she was raised below, raised us up below the poverty line. But God provided it all the way. And it's, it's a lesson for me that when things, pressures come on, it's a great example to say, she, she's still living, right. she's doing fine, and she made it some kind of way. Right. We know it was the grace of God, you know, God's... The sovereign divine Billy gets the job done on her behalf. She couldn't do it, right. and that's that's grace is important in our lives. But it, this was a great example for me to, to lean on and remember whenever a challenge comes my way. Right. And it's probably something each person listening to this needs to understand too, because that's tough to beat. Right. Eight kids, less than ten thousand dollars a year. Yeah, and she did it. Yeah. Right. Well, I know that. Um, you know, again, we're talking about the qualifications on how, where you're in a position to kind of counsel, guide, advise people who find themselves in similar positions that you guys were raised up in. Not only did you find yourself successful by all the secular or the worldly uh, ways and, and the fact that you're educated, right, both went to Stanford University, 
uh, and found yourself uh, successful in raising the family yourselves, being married 34 years. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. um, and so all those things, but I think you really hit on something there, Larry, in terms of, so you have all of what the practical tools are like that you've set yourself up with. You went through proper channels or went through ways that you guys had determined how to not find yourselves in those positions. But you hit the key in terms of there's the godly principles that you guys have used throughout your uh, marriage and throughout your relationship and how you raise your kids. Because I know that it wasn't all just fine and dandy from what I understand. From I mean, there's medical school loans. From, even from starting a business, you have to, I mean, you don't usually start off, you know, with the lotto, you know, so it, it, there was some challenges along the way. Um, where would you say that? I think he should um, talk about one of the challenges when we first got married and he he had signed to play with the um, the Texas Rangers in uh, minor league baseball right. and um, he played with them for a while and then he had a meniscus injury of his knee had several surgeries and he eventually had to be released and here he was a Stanford graduate and couldn't play baseball and couldn't get a job mm. I was in medical school and that's a whole story by itself I mean you can I think that would be 1981, if you look at the LA Times of that year, on the front cover of the living section is a picture of me and my mom, and um, she has that article, it's so funny, <laughs> because I got into medical school and um, it was too much money. I mean, my mom, by that time, she was a secretary, but it was Tufts University and I couldn't go, and so I just, um, but, you know, I had accepted Christ young. And I was praying, and I just got an unction from the Holy Spirit to just send a letter to the newspaper. Um, my RA said, yeah, I'll do it because, you know, people need to know, and you never know what's going to happen. And I sent a letter, and I'm like, it's just not fair. I went to Stanford University for four years. I've gotten into medical school, which was my whole goal, and now I'm going to be unable to go. When they sent me the acceptance letter, I was all excited, but then the financial officer called and said, your, mom, your mom's a secretary, sweetie. You can't go. You need to find a job as a secretary, get some kind of other job, and it broke my heart. But I wrote this letter, and within hours, I had camera crew in my dorm room, <laughs> uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, the LA Times, flew me home so I could be with my mom, and I had a group of lawyers, I had other people send me money, and but before they had even done that, the school had called because they were so uh, angry at the bad publicity and said they would give me this financial aid packet to get me through. <laughs> but the whole point was, he didn't have a job. I'm in school. We had no money, obviously. And um, he wanted to work. He was a psychology major. He wanted to work in his field, but there were no jobs. And so I'm like, well, we're hungry. And we were eating top ramen and uh, oranges. That's what we're eating. <laughs> and um, I said, you know, you kind of got to get whatever job you can take. And he didn't want to be a security guard, which he, he did finally do. And he, and he was a janitor. And it was a very humbling experience because, you know, we wanted better. We went to college mm -hmm. and we thought we deserved better and we wanted better and we were um, not really wanting to stay in that position, but you have to realize it was just a season. Mm -hmm. So he took it because we were newlyweds and he knew he had to be the provider. And only because he was mopping the floor that day in a big business uh, facility did he run into a friend from Stanford who offered him um, a position in, you know, a, what do you call a incoming position. I remember it was $15,000 a year. And we, it could have been a million for us, you know. And that's the only reason he even met him. Yeah, I think it, it, you have to look forward and have some kind of goal. And no, in order to get to a goal, you have to start somewhere. And a lot of folks don't want to start. So for me at that time, I could have cried, oh me, oh my. Nobody really would have cared, right? Right. right? Okay, so I said, all right, I'm going to get these jobs. And there's nothing wrong with being a janitor. nothing wrong with being a security guard. Those are great jobs for people. But for me, I had bigger goals. But I had to start somewhere. So I didn't really care. And when Vanessa said she was hungry, I was very hungry. <laughs> so I had to do something, right? <laughs> so anyway, I took the job. and um, But consistently throughout our lives, and I'll talk about mine, you know, even though you may not feel like you walk according to the principles of the word daily, if it's ingrained in you at some point, which it was for my mom and grandmother, it comes out. Mm -hmm. 
And the one thing I always remember, you remember that story, uh, the show Truth or Consequences? Maybe you're too young. Mm. All right, but that's too young. All, right. <laughs> all the other old folks remember. There's this show called Truth or Consequences. So it stuck with me. Either you know the truth or you might suffer the consequences. Mm -hmm. The truth is the word of God. Mm -hmm. You shall know the truth and it will set you free. So for me, as long as I had the principle of the word in my life, the truth in my life, it was going to set me free. Set me free from worry, set me free from fear, doubt, mm -hmm. low self-esteem. And so that's regardless of where you're at, you have to put the word in you. And the Bible says that you are destroyed, people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge. It doesn't say you're okay because you're lack of knowledge, it says you're destroyed because of your lack of knowledge. So to me, the simple remedy, regardless of where you're at, whether you're a single parent, two parent, there's some messed up folks that have two parents. You know that and I know it. There's some messed up folks that have single parents. We happen to come from the single scenario. But you need to know the truth. And it's gonna set you free. And if you don't apply the word or know enough to know the word, then you're gonna have challenges in your life. Not that when you become a Christian or you have the word, everything's peachy, cream, and it's perfect, mm -hmm. but the word gets you through. Right. Yes. And it's something that gives you hope regardless of the situation. And that's what I had. I had hope. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what hope meant, but I had it, right? It was just an instinct that, that was ingrained in me when I was really young. Mm -hmm. And you know that I, my mom at that time, um, when I was young, she wasn't serving God. Um, but she had been raised um, in the church, um, but we weren't attending church. Um, but because there were outreach programs at a local Baptist church, I started going to the mm -hmm. church and getting involved in with the youth and mm -hmm. doing different things. And it takes a village, yeah. you know. So when you feel alone, you're really not alone mm -hmm. because the church has so many programs. And it was um, my Sunday school teacher when I was 12 years old. And I really looked up to her. She was a, a humble, beautiful um, woman who just taught us Sunday school. But afterwards, you know, and I was in the puberty uh, uh, time of my life and wasn't getting along with my mom. Um, she was working a lot and I didn't really um, get along with her well. But I really bonded with mm -hmm. this woman. And she would take me home after church. And she's the one that taught me how to cook. And um, she would just, um, I would see her clean the house, I would see her care for her family, and I accepted Christ um, through her, through that church. Um, and I, so I accepted Christ before my mom, and I led my mom back to the Lord when I was um, 25, you know. And so I think that it takes a village, and if you get yourself surrounded by people in church so that they can mentor your children, mm -hmm. um, that also helps. Yeah. Yeah. Let me think about this now. This is how... God is, how great he is. We may not see step by step what he's doing in our life, but when you look back, you say, how did I get from point A to point B? Yeah. I bet everybody listening can say that. My mom looks back over her life, I imagine she said, how did I get to this point where I have eight kids, I can say all of them are successful. Mm -hmm. we, got some, we got some rascals. <laughs> all right. But five of them went to college. Mm -hmm. One of them's in the Hall of Fame, and one's a, a TV broadcaster, uh, and three of them graduated, um, and under a $10,000 a year annual salary, this is what God did. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, But you can't just roll out of bed and expect to snap your finger. I mean, mm -hmm. there's some sacrifice, there's some scraping of the knees, you got to get up, mm -hmm. you got to keep pushing, you fall down, you got to get up. A lot of folks fall down, they stay down. Some folks don't even want to get up in the morning. So, you know, you got to work. You got to put the time and the effort in. But for me, it all gets back to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. For those of you who are listening, but if you guys are paying attention, you already heard the answer to my next question. But just, just to make it clear for those people who maybe didn't get it, what would you say for those people who are saying, like, okay, yeah, but you're the exception to the rule. Yeah, you wrote a letter. You got your college paid for. Yeah, you, I mean... It happened for you, but I'm from the wrong side of the road. I look the wrong way. I was raised in the wrong place, the wrong time. Uh, I, I'm the wrong gender. I'm the wrong race. Whatever it might be, what what are some things that you would say who feels they've just been given the wrong cards? And yeah, your story's cool and all, but that's that's you. That's not me. Because I know you know that's just that thought. But again, I'm hearing the answer. But do you guys want to? Yeah. Well, if I showed you some of my 
pictures when I was five years old, you'd quickly understand how poor we were. We shared clothes, all right? Picture one, I had my brother's pants on. Two years later, he wearing the same pants in a different picture. Uh, we grew up with zero. You understand what I'm saying? With nothing. And so if, if there was a group of folks in our church and said, where did you start from? We'd be at the end of the line in terms of, so. Talk to, about how uh, you had to pick the beans. And stuff. No, we picked beans, picked right. strawberries. I ate a lot of beans out of strawberries too. It was fun. <laughs> All right. But that's how we made a living. Right. Uh, we went fishing, not for fun. We went fishing to eat. Right. All right. So this, you're talking about folks that grew up with zero. Right. That was us. Yeah. And so there's no excuses. No temptation has been given you such as it's common mm -hmm. to man. Right. None of this old me or my. It's common to man. God's faithful. He'll not allow you to get tested beyond what you're able. Right. But the key to that verse to me is it's common to man. Everybody's got challenges, trials. There's no excuses. Right. So we have to get to the point where we say, all right, I got a great God. I got the word. I got me some instructions by the word. And I'm going to live by them. And so now I'm going from being defeated to being a winner. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the truth. Yeah. Okay? That's what the word says. Right. So it doesn't matter where you start. Right. It's where you finish. And how are you going to run that race? And are you going to get up and keep moving or are you going to stay down there and cry? Because so people, there are, temptations? people aren't going to feel sorry for you. Was there temptation? Oh, sorry, Dr. Reed. Was I was just going to say that I think that you have to realize that God's not a respecter of persons. Mm -hmm. You can't look at us and think that you're different. You know, and for me, you know, we had nothing. When my dad left, we had nothing. And even though it was just one child, we were still below the poverty level. Mm -hmm. And actually, I cannot remember going to a store to buy clothes until I was in college. All my clothes are from the Salvation Army. Everything in our house was from the Salvation Army or given to us. And then my mom had saved up to get a sewing machine. And she made a lot of my clothes, which was, you know, I was the brunt of a lot of jokes and, and this kind of thing. But um, I think that it is your mindset, and you have to renew your mind to the Word of God. You cannot be what people have told you you are or what people expect for you to be. Don't be the statistic, mm -hmm. but be what God's Word says you are. And you're more than a conqueror. You're an overcomer. He's not a respecter of persons. Mm -hmm. So I would say the Word of God applies to everybody. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just apply to me and Larry, but it happens when faith is believing what you can't see. You know, and um, you have to renew your mind to his word, which means not just knowing the verse, not just memorizing the verse, but getting it in your soul so that you believe it um, totally and completely, 100 percent. And you know that God is faithful and you know he's going to come through for your situation specifically. You know, you can't go based on my faith or his faith, but we took it. We took that word of God. We applied it to our lives. And one thing that we always did when we had nothing, when we were eating oranges, we always tithed. Mm -hmm. We always tithed. When I was getting... You those orange peels. <laughs> go ahead. When I didn't have the income, that I didn't go to a lot of my classes in medical school because I worked full-time as a secretary. And um, even when I didn't have, I only got my, um, what do you call, school loan money, um, I would tithe off of what I needed to live. So if I needed to buy, if I bought $50 worth of groceries and I had to pay uh, this much, I would tithe off of that, off of my student loan money where they only give you, seriously only give you enough to live on, I'd still tithe off of that. Right. And people, it would be amazing how we go at, uh, we were going to a little Baptist church, we were in Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, we would go to church and somebody would be like, hey, Brother Larry, Sister Vanessa, and they'd give us a hug and they would, they'd have money in their hands. Uh -huh. And they would, we just... I mean, we didn't ask for anything, right. but that would be enough, and it would be just enough wow. of what we needed. Yeah. Yeah, I, and tithing is a key part of our life. I would not feel comfortable the next day if we didn't tithe. Right. That's how ingrained it's, it's it's in our system that much. How much it's part of our life. Right. It's just automatic. Um, but uh, the key for me, another key, I guess, is and we're talking about these four points in our little segment before. One of the things that people deal with is fear. So if you think about a single mom or a single dad or a person in fear, we have to use the word to get us out of that. But the Bible talks about how God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That word fear, the Greek word delia, which means timidity, mm -hmm. 
He didn't give you the spirit of being t- timid. Mm-hmm. We got to take it by force. Mm-hmm. You got to know who you are, regardless mm-hmm. of circumstance. And God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you one of love. He gave you one of power and gave you a sound mind. Mm-hmm. And so if we have a sound mind by having the word in us, renew us, mm-hmm. get our mind right, we're going to go out and be bold. We're not going to be timid. Yeah. So a lot of times when you're timid and you're walking in fear, living in fear, it's because you don't have that word in you. That's right. And everybody can buy, get a Bible. You can get a free Bible here. It's a question, do you want to read it or not? That's and that's one thing I can say that doesn't get put me above anybody else. Everybody has an opportunity to read the word and put it in their life. That's and good. once you do that, your life's going to change. That's good. Well, I think that's a perfect place. We're going to take a quick break, um, and we will be right back. Thank you, guys.